Hello, welcome to the next episode of Vision Basic. I was hoping this video would only take a couple weeks to make, but instead it has taken several weeks. So I apologize for the wait, but I think the wait will have been worth it. Before continuing with the topic of this video, I just want to put a few things out there first. My plan with this channel was to cover basic programming, vision-based or not, and even a little machine language here and there, but after releasing Vision Basic back in May, I have since realized that it would be best to create a set of tutorials to help users of Vision Basic to get the most out of their software. After all, to try and cover every little tiny thing in a single manual would result in a very huge manual indeed. Now, if you don't know what Vision Basic is, make sure to visit my website, visionbasic.net, and watch some of my prior videos on this channel. I also want to point out that the manual for Vision Basic assumes that you already know C64 Basic pretty well, and that you already know the basics of sprite and character graphics, sound creation, and other capabilities of the machine. The manual was designed as a type of reference guide. It is recommended that all users read through the manual from start to finish and then refer back to it when necessary. Mark it up how you want or add page tabs if you'd like. For those who are relatively new to the Commodore 64, there is a lot of information out there on the internet, but I'd like to point you to some of my favorite resources for the beginner. All of these resources can be found on the website archive.org. If you're completely new to the C64, check out the Commodore 64 User's Guide. This is the first book most of us became acquainted with when we plugged in our machines for the very first time. This guide does a pretty good job at getting people started with their machines. But this book obviously won't teach you everything, so the next book I would point you to is the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide. It's a great reference book for beginners and advanced programmers alike. It repeats information you'll find in the Commodore 64 User's Guide, but it's not as beginner friendly, so that's why I don't recommend it for those who are just starting out. Next, I'd like to recommend Mapping the Commodore 64. This book is a treasure trove of information and I go back to it all the time. Vision Basic wouldn't exist without it. And when you're ready for the leap to machine language, I'd like to recommend Machine Language for Beginners. I also recommend looking up issues of Compute Magazine and Compute's Gazette. You will find all sorts of tips and tricks inside and all sorts of games and useful programs. And I know that many of you will have plenty of other recommendations. And really, there are plenty of other resources on YouTube and various websites out there. The nice thing about the books I've mentioned, though, is that the information in them is very concentrated. So you don't have to look all over the internet for various pieces of information. At the end of this video, I will be showcasing a couple channels that you might find interesting, so make sure to stick around for that. And make sure to read the information in the description as well before leaving. Okay, so what is this video going to be about? Well, programming in Commodore Basic often means not being able to do all the cool stuff that those assembly language guys get to do. Am I right? And one thing that seems particularly off limits is smooth scrolling. Well, not anymore. We're going to slay that beast right here today in this video. Not only are we going to make smooth scrolling happen, but I'm going to show you how to incorporate it in your own Vision Basic programs. Keep in mind that this is a tutorial, and it will be a lengthy one. We'll be spending most of our time examining code, so feel free to fast forward to the visual stuff if you're not here for the tutorial part. The code presented here will be made available on my website as a disk image, and you can use the provided smooth scroll add-on pack in your own Vision Basic programs. Now, originally I was going to include a scroll command in Vision Basic but I eventually dropped the idea for a few reasons, actually. First, the version I had initially come up with was only going to perform a coarse scroll. If a person was to use the command, it was supposed to shift the text screen a single byte in whatever direction they chose, diagonal even. 
it was the responsibility of the programmer to fill in the gap that would open up. This isn't a particularly efficient method for the scrolling process. Another reason I dropped the command from Vision Basic is because it would significantly add bulk to the command support library, potentially causing the scroll code to become part of every user program whether scrolling was used or not. I had to decide what commands made the most sense to include in the command library, and a scroll command just didn't make sense to me when all things were considered. Anyhow, that's a bit of history for you. The nice thing about Vision Basic is that we can create our own commands when we need them. So what does smooth scrolling entail? Well, it involves two different processes. Firstly, we have the smooth part, which involves shifting the screen by single pixels. We poke a couple registers to do this, namely 53265 and 53270. I'm not going to go into depth here about these registers though. These registers actually don't move the screen data itself, they just shift the visible screen by up to 7 pixels in a particular direction, that's all. The problem is that you actually need to eventually perform a course scroll every so often. Now to prevent this video from getting too long, as it's already going to be too long, I'm just not going to go into all of the details on this. I've set up a routine that does all the complex work for you. The process is a complex dance of sorts between smooth and coarse scrolling, and I will give you a brief glimpse at the code that accomplishes this. Now why is coarse scrolling a problem? Well, coarse scrolling is a very time consuming process. As a matter of fact, if you employ the most common technique of moving data around, you'll find that it takes more than a single screen refresh to perform this task. As long as we stay ahead of the raster line while moving the data, we can still get good results. But if we want the best results we can get, we need to move the data faster than that. Let me show you what I mean by using the common, quote unquote, common technique of moving data around. I'm going to load up a short program here. And let's list it. If you don't understand assembly language, then just bear with me for this part and any other parts where I talk about assembly language, or machine language, whatever you want to call it. This routine waits for a particular scan line before attempting to copy data from an area in memory to the visible text screen. The common instructions used to move memory around are the indirect indexed addressing instructions in line 130. Despite their versatility, they also happen to be the slowest instructions of the lot. Let's run this program to see what it does. Now this might seem pretty impressive as far as speed is concerned, but keep in mind that this is a coarse scroll. Here we are watching the contents of C64 memory scroll by diagonally. You'll notice that most of the border is white and a small portion of the border is green. The white area represents how long it takes during a single screen refresh to move the data from memory to the text screen. Notice also that the bottom three lines of the text screen are not being drawn to. The point of this demonstration is that we don't have enough time to finish drawing in the last three lines of the screen. If the white areas touch, it's game over. That green area represents all the time we have left to take care of those last three lines and it just isn't enough, that green area in the border. On a PAL machine, we might have enough cycles, but definitely not on an NTSC machine, and that is the version I've got Vice set up here with. Even worse is the fact that our routine here doesn't effectively handle wraparounds, which I'll get into later. Anyhow, the faster we can move the data, the better. So how can we copy the data faster, you might ask? Well, we resort to something called self-modifying code. And for some, it's like a big no-no, but um, and we're just we're and we're going to use some faster instructions as well. I'm sorry, I'm garbling up my uh, speech here because I'm improving, <laughs> improvising, and we're going to copy five lines of text at a time instead of the usual one line at a time. Let's go ahead and stop the program. Now this video picks up where the last video left off. In my last video. I showed you how my sprite editor program called the Spreaditor 
can be used to create rotating sprite shapes. So in this video, I'm going to employ the shapes that I created in the last video to create a simple game. I originally wanted to type in each line and explain what it does as I did in a prior video, but there's just too much to discuss here. So I'm going to run through the code that I've already created. This video is going to be part of a series of videos, and in each video I plan to add something new to the game to help finish it off. In this video, I just want to focus on the scrolling and the programming for the player's ship. With smooth scrolling, you have a few options. Probably the easiest scroll to do is the vertical one, and I'm pretty sure the code for this kind of scroll would execute the fastest. The next fastest scroll is the horizontal one, but the one I want to focus on in this video is the scroll that allows you to scroll in pretty much any direction, up, down, left, right. You also need to consider if you want to employ a wraparound for your scroll. A wraparound allows you to keep moving without hitting the edge of your larger background design. Your background simply tiles and repeats itself. There are two ways to perform a wraparound. You can simply duplicate portions of your larger background design and this method allows for a scroll routine that is less complex and will execute faster. On the screen you will see a representation of how this works. Each rectangle here represents a single text screen worth of data. If you scroll from the top left of this larger image to the right, then when you hit the duplication off to the right, you would then have your program spring back to the left side of the image. And if you scroll down this larger image and reach the bottom, you would have the program spring back to the top of the image. This technique could provide a seamless experience. The downside with this technique is that you have to waste five text screens worth of data to pull it off. I was originally going to go with this idea because I wasn't sure if I could pull off a more complex routine that would be able to wrap from each edge of the larger image and connect with the opposite side within a single screen refresh. But I succeeded and I can prove it. Let's load up one of my test programs here. Okay, and we're going to run it. And I guess let's, let's uh, speed this up. Here I have filled 9,000 bytes of memory with random data and, a vis and the visible text screen acts as a window into this larger image of data. The numbers running along the left side are the addresses for each line of data. The flickering border colors give me some information to see if the routine is indeed copying a full screen of data in less than one screen refresh. But here we have a repeating cycle of two screen refreshes where one screen refresh is for the copying of data to the screen and the other screen refresh would be for our actual game code. Now with constant screen movements either vertically or horizontally we don't actually need to copy the screen data every time the screen gets scrolled by a single pixel. We could actually use seven of those pixel movements to perform game related tasks. But since this routine is meant to allow the player to roam freely in all directions, it just gets too complicated to keep up with each moment. The entire screen needs to be refreshed with data from memory, especially if you aren't programming completely in, a, in assembly language. I am actually able to control the direction of movement in this test program, so let's make things a little more interesting. And see, I can move left and right, or rotate, actually. Bear with me, I'm going to try to read, <laughs> read and, or do my dialogue here, and move the screen. Okay. Now, despite being called a smooth scroll, the movement will appear to be a little jerky on the pixel level when the movement isn't perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical or perfectly 45 degrees. This is because we can't, to the best of my knowledge, shift the screen by a fraction of a pixel when we need to. The tiny jittering might appear less noticeable if we were to shift the screen with every single screen refresh, but it's rather difficult to use the remaining time left in one refresh after the screen has been moved. I suppose this task is possible if we were to use pure machine language, 
but I don't know if the commercial games out there are able to handle all of the game's inner workings in that small bit of time that's left or not. Since we're trying to use BASIC to control all of the sprites and sound and such, it's my opinion that we should give ourselves a full screen refresh for all of the actual game programming. So for every second of gameplay, we're we'll be using 30 screen refreshes for screen movement and 30 refreshes for the actual controlling of sprites and sounds and such. And we'll just be alternating between the two tasks. And we'll still be able to achieve decent results. And I, I'm just, like I said, I'm just trying to control this <laughs> screen movements and read, and read it. And so it's, it's not working too well. Just enjoy it for what it is. When using Vision Basic to make games, you have to look at these kinds of decisions. For example, with my Herald game, there is so much going on in the game that I decided to time everything so that each sprite takes turns being the prime focus during a single screen refresh. All of the sprites can be moved during each screen refresh, but only one sprite gets to make decisions and be checked against character and sprite collisions. But if you examine the code for the game, you'll see that this technique works fairly well. Also, you don't necessarily have to fit everything neatly within a single screen refresh when it comes to certain types of games, as many games written in regular basic don't have the luxury of being able to accomplish a whole lot within a single screen, single refresh. And yet people actually make games in regular basic. The idea of trying to fit everything within 1 60th of a second is that there is it's there so that we can try to prevent sprites from blinking every so often and to help maintain a constant game speed. If you're a beginner at basic programming, you'll probably not want to try to confine yourself in this fashion. I do want to point out that the C64 key scan routine causes these occasional pauses in the border, or actually entirely, uh, when I hold the arrow keys, keys down, which I'm using to change the direction of movement. You'll notice the border remains full black, full on black for a brief moment, and all movement will stop. I've tried figuring out how to eliminate the pause, and the only solution I've been able to come up with is to turn off interrupts entirely and just check for specific keys using a more convoluted method. I'll demonstrate how to do this in the program listing. Let me go ahead and stop. The game I'm working on for this video runs somewhere between beginner and advanced, so let's go ahead and load the file so that we can examine the code. And let's list the routine that does the smooth scrolling for us. The goal of this video isn't to explain all the intricate details about how smooth scrolling works, so I'm not going to explain every line, but I will explain what this routine tries to do. Lines 60,000 to 60,080 calculate a position within the larger image map. In the case of this game, I decided to make the map 120 pixels wide and 75 pixels tall, and this is about 9 text screens of character data. In line 60,070, we set up a pointer to the line of data we are starting our transfer. The full routine transfers data from the larger image map to the visible text screen, 1,000 bytes total out of 9,000 bytes available. This part of the routine also preps the values for the minor screen panning that will be done. We need to extract three bits of data from the coordinates within the larger image map to aid in the smooth portion of our scroll. One thing that also needs to be noted is that when you are doing a versatile smooth scroll where the f we can flow in all directions, the screen will need to have its dimensions visibly reduced to 38 bytes wide by 24 bytes tall, or characters. This is all common knowledge for those familiar with doing a smooth scroll. And I'm going to scroll up. This part of the routine, starting at line 60,500, sets up some tags, or labels, as they're called in machine language, uh, to help us self-modify the code further down. In line 60,600 and 60,810, 
you will see a poke of sorts that modifies the border color so that we can see how long it takes to perform certain actions. You'll see lots of color bands in the border once we run the program. Anyhow, when we are ready to start copying the data from memory to the visible text screen, we will be setting the border to white in line 6810 so that the white portion of the border will tell us how long the memory transfer is taking. Starting in line 60,800, we are waiting for the earliest opportunity we can to begin our transfer, which happens to be the raster line just below the lower edge of the visible text screen. And in line 60,820, we plug in our pre-calculated values into the registers that handle scrolling on the pixel level. Now, if you're wondering why I'm not using my pointer to point to stuff, it's because I have decided to shrink the... Uh, the screen so I can get better recording <laughs> and yeah this is pointers gonna appear huge here so I, I just I don't know uh, when I say a line number just uh, just look at it because I don't know this is probably gonna weird you out okay and now I gotta scroll down to 6100 here okay scroll up a little bit more Okay, this next section is one of five very similar sections of code that actually copy data to the visible text screen. Each section of code copies five lines of characters to the text screen. In order for smooth scrolling to work, we have to stay ahead of the raster line, so we can't simply copy all 25 lines at once. And we can't simply copy a thousand bytes from memory as they are in the larger image map, because the text screen is 40 characters wide, but the larger image map is 120 characters wide. Now, if we were creating a game that only scrolled vertically, this would greatly simplify matters for us and the routine would execute much faster. It is also important to note at this point that we are only able to scroll the text data and not the color data. When you make games that employ smooth scrolling, typically you will need to pick a few colors for your multicolor background if you go with multicolor mode, and you're pretty much stuck with the color scheme you have chosen. There are workarounds for certain cases, but we're not going to attempt any workarounds in our game here. Anyhow, going back to the code you see here, line 61,000 to 61,050, perform the self-modifying I was talking about earlier. These lines modify the first column of addresses you see in lines 61,090 to 61,130. <laughs> the second column of addresses actually get modified by a separate routine further down in the listing. A routine actually gets called first and only one time. Since all of the addresses you see here get modified, the values you see here really don't matter. I just plugged some values in here and they are lo no longer relevant to the real addresses we will be working with anyhow since I've made changes since starting this program. Okay, so line 61,070 to 61,140 actually copy five lines of characters from the larger image map to the top five lines of the visible text screen. The reason we are copying five lines instead of one is that the code actually executes faster because we are eliminating about four lines of code similar to what you see in line 61,140 at the bottom there. Every clock cycle saved matters here. So if we view the rest of the routine, we'll see that the code pretty much repeats itself for every set of five lines being copied. And I'll just go down and down. You should be able to notice the repetition. Let's get down to 6,000. Okay. And we have a routine at 6, 62,000 that handles the vertical wraparound for when we reach the bottom of the larger image map. And this routine gets called as necessary. Let me back up and you'll see it's called adjust there in 62,000. And you'll see um, on the, let's see, the right hand side there, um, you'll see the word adjust, 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 and adjust. And that's when it gets called, or where it gets called, anyways. And now I got to go down to 63,000. Okay. 
And at 63,000, we have a routine that must be called first before we can even use the larger smooth scroll routine above. This routine only needs to be called once, but it helps to set things up for the smooth scroll routine. As the comments point out, we need to specify the width and height for the larger image map. We need to specify where our text screen is located, and we need to tell the routine where our larger image map is located, at least where it starts. The main purpose of this routine is to self-modify the code of the main scrolling routine above by plugging in the locations for each horizontal line of the visible text screen. This only needs to be done once, so we don't need to waste valuable computer cycles performing this task each time we need to scroll the screen. After all, the text screen isn't going anywhere, right? You might be wondering why we would even need a routine like this if we were to put the right values in the right spots in the actual code itself. Well, I wanted the main routine to be versatile and be able to be used by anyone, so they might want to put their text screen somewhere else. This routine allows them to easily do that. And below this routine, as I scroll, are data statements full of cosine values. Instead of installing the add-on pack which generates such values, I chose to put them into data statements so that I could avoid the wait time needed to generate them all. We'll need these values to help us move through our image map at a constant speed in all directions and not just the typical up, down, left, right, and diagonal. These values allow us to aim our movements towards a full 360 degrees rotation. We'll also need sign values, but to save memory, I'm employing a cheat of sorts, since a section of the values here can double for sign values. If you advance 90 degrees forward through this set of values, you'll be able to access the sign values for the same original angle, except that the values will all be inverted with respect to the negative sign. So plus becomes minus and minus becomes plus. So before running the program, I want to explain how I laid everything out in memory. The support routines for Vision Basic do take up a lot of memory. But Vision Basic makes up for this by giving you access to all of the free RAM beneath Basic ROM. But if we really want to play it safe, we need to push all of our screen, sprite, and character data as high up in memory as we can. This is where using the last bank of video memory comes in handy. It isn't recommended that you try to put your text screen under the kernel ROM, but it's a great place to put our sprite shape data and we have lots and lots of sprite shapes to find a place for. I've created 36 shapes so that my spaceship can rotate by 10 degree increments. I also have 36 shapes to provide extra coloring for the previous 36 shapes mentioned. If you don't know what I, why I'm doing this, make sure to check out my previous video about the Spreadator sprite editor. And I also have 36 shapes for the lasers that shoot out of the ship. Um, I actually can cut that back to about 18, but that would make the programming more complicated, and I've got enough memory, so I'm just going to stick with it. Finally, I have 36 shapes for a nifty explosion that I crafted, which did not appear in my last video. And I have a blank shape at the end of that explosion that just simplifies making the ship disappear after it explodes. That comes to 145 sprite shapes that I need to find a place for. I also need 1K for video RAM and 2K for an altered character set. And part of the reason I want to push things so high is that we have that larger image map of about 9K that needs somewhere to go. So not taking the image map into consideration, we need a little more than 12K for all of this. Video Bank 3, the last bank in the C64's memory, has 16K that we can use. And since I want to push the text screen as high as I can get it, starting at location 52224, that really just leaves us the 12K after that for everything else. So we've got the space and a tiny bit of wiggle room. Okay, so let me paint in the areas of memory where we are going to put things in the graphic on screen. This table can be found in Appendix D of the Vision Basic Manual. Now, if you're not super great at figuring out where to put things for your own programs in Vision Basic, I do recommend using Bank 3 since it pushes everything away from your core program code and the variable table and such. In a previous program, I think I used Bank 2. 
For the sake of simplicity, just mimic what I do. I've decided to use pretty much the entire area of RAM under the kernel ROM for 108 of my sprite shapes, all the shapes dealing with the ship and its lasers. I'll be loading them in at 58112. And you can easily load sprite shape files into this area without issue. The shape numbers here will range from 140 to 247. Loading in the explosion shapes will be a little bit tricky. We'll be putting them under the color RAM starting at 55296. Believe it or not, there actually is some RAM underneath that RAM. And the way to access it is by turning off both the kernel and the basic ROMs. The problem is that we cannot load a file into this region because we need the kernel on in order to load our shapes. So I have them loaded in at 49152 and then we'll move them to their final spot after the load. About five of those shapes will extend into the RAM under the kernel, which is why I loaded the other set of shapes in at 58112. The shape numbers for the explosion will range from 96 to 132. As mentioned earlier, we will have our text screen at 52224. And we'll be using character set 26, which causes Vision Basic to copy the character data from the ROM in the same location into the RAM beneath it. 3K of our 9K image map will take up the first 3K of this bank. So we will be using pretty much all the RAM here, with the exception of about 1K in the form of seven sprite shapes before and seven shapes after the ship shapes. Say that five times fast. <laughs> Uh, the remaining 6K of image map data will reside at the top of Video Bank 2. Okay, so I feel that I at least owe you a chance to see the program in action before explaining the rest of the program code, since you've been waiting patiently so far. So let's run it. And we're going to speed up a little bit here. Boom. Okay. Before we can enter the game loop, I have it ask if we want to load the external files, all of the sprite shapes. Here I'm using Vice without true drive emulation, so this isn't really necessary for me, but if you're using a real disk drive, you might not want the data to have to load each time you run the program. I suppose I could whip up a more complicated routine that will check the RAM to see if all of the sprite shape data is still intact. Perhaps I'll add that for the next video. Anyhow, let's press Y and then we'll be waiting a brief moment for the cosine data to be read. And get ready. All right, before I start steering the ship, I just want to address the bands of color in the border. There are two sets of colors alternating in the border. That's why it is flashing. At least I hope that the video I am capturing makes it look that way. I use these color bands to help assess how long certain parts of the program are taking to perform their given tasks. I'll remove all of this activity going on when the game is finished. For now, it's a programming aid, which I highly recommend. The white area in the border mentioned earlier is how long it takes to copy the character data from the larger image map to the text screen. Now, because it's flashing, you probably don't see the white, but if I press the Alt key, there you go. You can see most of it. And the other part of it actually starts here, but on the other screen refresh. So from the bottom here, all the way down and start back at the top to about here, this is where the data, this is how long it takes for the data to get copied from the larger image map to the text screen. And fortunately, the routine is able to stay ahead of the raster line, but just barely. The darker gray area here is where I time to put in the routine that cycles the colors for the engine thrust and the blinking of the mines that you see scrolling down the screen. Or, well, that you will <laughs> when I resume. I chose to put the routine there because we have plenty of space in this black area from here to here that we can take advantage of while we wait for the raster line to get to the bottom of the screen for the next refresh. And like I said, I don't know if I pointed this out already, but this is actually the starting the new screen refresh, and that's why it's not white. Remember, we're using one refresh to move the character data of a thousand bytes, and we're using another refresh for pretty much everything else. 
at least at this stage of the, of the game. It's clear that we might be able to put more stuff in this black area, like at least right here, but we need to be careful not to push things too far down. Okay, so what is the green area for? First, we wait for the um, raster line to reach the bottom of the screen again, and this is a prime time to move our sprites and change their shapes. Let me switch to the other one. I haven't even added any enemy ships to this game yet, and you can see that we've used up all of the off-screen time to move our <laughs> our sprites and change shapes. So I'm going to have to change the technique I'm using. I see from here it was green down to here, and this is all the off-screen time. I actually employ a user-defined command to move each sprite shape, and it's clear to me that the parameter swapping employed by the user defined command is a little time too time consuming. So I'll be switching to something else in my next video. Next comes the blue area in the border. This is where I execute the code that moves the ship and handles the laser fire. It actually runs pretty fast, so this should leave us plenty of time for the enemy ships. I won't be adding enemy ships until the next video because I can't imagine how much longer this video would be if I added all that in. And finally, the red area in the border is actually part of the smooth scroll routine. This is the part of the routine that calculates the location within the larger image map that copying needs to begin. The whole distance between the red area and the white at the bottom, from here to here, of the screen is where the scroll routine simply waits for the raster interrupt to reach line 247, so that it can begin the transfer of the character data. To kind of simplify all of this, the closer the red part gets to the bottom, the less time we have left for game-related tasks. So for now, we're okay. If the red area reaches the bottom, things are going to start looking shabby. Now, I do want to stress to beginners that you probably don't want to put yourselves under the pressure of making sure that all of your main game loop code will execute within a single screen refresh. You might be better off just letting the smooth scroll routine do its thing and just free flow after that. If the scrolling gets a little slow, you can always increase how far the screen jumps each time the scroll routine gets called. As a matter of fact, the screen you see here is, when it is moving, is actually moving at about two pixels at a time instead of one, and it still looks reasonably smooth. Your first goal as a beginner should be to make a playable game. And as you progress in your programming skills, you can start to improve other aspects like complexity and smoothing out the rough edges, per se. Now, before I start moving the ship and letting the uh, graphics move again, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of not allowing it to move so I can like delete any parts that I make a mistake on. Uh, <laughs> I just want to point out that the mines you see here are simply character graphics. Making them into sprites would possibly mean using some kind of multiplexer, and I don't intend on making this tutorial any more complex than it already is. So the method I'm using for collision detection is actually the built-in collision detection on the C64 between sprites and background characters. I'm using a further trick up my sleeve as well to help keep this simple. Now I'm gonna start moving this again. You might notice that the ship is coming into contact with the stars. You would think that this would trigger a collision, but it doesn't. The trick here is that I'm using bit pair 01 for the stars. And this corresponds to the first color shared by all characters in multicolor mode. For whatever reason, collisions between sprites and this bit pair do not trigger a collision. By using this collision detection method, we end up getting to avoid having to peek at the character data beneath the sprite shape. This latter technique will consume valuable computer cycles and it tends to be inaccurate and complex. Okay, so let's steer this ship around. Joystick left, wait. Joystick left to rotate left. And joystick right, oops. <laughs> to rotate to the right. And when we hit a mine, the ship explodes as you've just seen. Now this explosion was also created in the Spreadator, 
But even though the Spreadator allows for complex shape rotations, it does not have the ability to scale shapes, at least not in conjunction with the rotation. I wanted to have the explosion rotate as it expands and then have the inner part of the explosion rotate as well until they both meet up and the whole thing vanishes. The explosion is also designed to expand rapidly at first and then expand more slowly near the end. Trying to figure this all out took a lot of trial and error. It requires setting up a table of values to multiply vertices by as the shape expands. And that's about as far as I'm going to go with the explanation. It's tedious work, but I wanted to have a cool looking explosion. So let's see it again. Okay. And I gotta see more of my text. Okay. While the ship explodes, we have some color cycling of the smoke cloud. And let's see if we can, to make the effect more fiery looking, I'm trying to find a, Sorry, and there you go. Um, make it more fiery looking. And when the ship reappears, we have it blink to let the player know that they need to steer clear of obstacles before collision detection is resumed. I wanted the cockpit to flash along with the rest of the ship, but I couldn't find a set of colors that seemed to work in conjunction with the grays of the ship. So only the gray part flashes. Another feature I added is that steering is disabled and we can't see the ship when it after it after it explodes again collisions are ignored when the ship is flashing and lasers cannot fire until the ship stops flashing these are all things you need to think about when programming a game and they often require flags and or timers so let's fire some lasers while we're at it hopefully i remember get the key right well okay i want to fire the lasers um when the when the ship is alive here okay um Oh, that's not the right key. Okay, there you go. Okay, I want to avoid stuff here. Whoa. <laughs> now, I, I don't want the lasers to be able to destroy the mines. The mines are intended to be obstacles that you have to weave around while enemy ships attack you. Like I said, I plan to add... Oh, I blew it up again, didn't I? Uh, like I said, I plan to add an enemy ship or two in the next tutorial. By then our lasers will be blowing things up. And the way I plan to adjust the difficulty level is through the number of mines on the screen. And the speed of the enemy ships, and perhaps the number of enemy ships we have to face. Because we have used up so many sprite shapes, I just plan to reuse the shapes of the shape of the fighter you see here. We could possibly open up some space for more shapes, but this is just a tutorial, so we'll we'll see. And this pretty much and this is pretty much what I have so far and I plan to add to this program for the next video. I might stop at two videos in this series or I might keep going. Regardless, let's stop the program and look under the hood, shall we? Okay. Starting with line zero. Always start a program with the CLR command, especially if you use strings. And speaking of strings, I reduced the size of the string field to a thousand bytes to help free up extra memory since I won't be needing to work with strings. And next we have the random command that gets the SID chip ready to produce random numbers for us. We also set all colors to black for now and clear the screen, and that's in line 10. In line 20, we have an array and some color values for the cycling of the flame color at the tail end of our spaceship. And in line 24, we have an array and some color values for the center of each mine so that it can flash. And from 30 to 37, we have an array and some color values for the ship explosion. And in line 40, we have an array and some color values to help our ship flash when it enters a new life. It's like deja vu. Now, I played around with each set of colors to see which colors would look best. You kind of just have to test different values and see what happens, and that's what I did. I personally wouldn't use arrays for these kind of things, but for the benefit of basic programmers watching, this is what I'm going with for the time being. I could easily resort to machine language for this stuff, and it would be much faster. In line 50, I have defined most of my decimal variables. It's generally good to define decimal variables near the front of your programs. 
though the reason for this has nothing to do with speed. Page forward, okay. In lines 60 and 70, we have some arrays. The ones in lines 60 and 65 have to do with cosine values for our ship, our laser fire, and the enemy ship, which doesn't exist yet. And we have another ray called swing costs that is meant for our ship, but I won't explain what it's for yet and probably not in this video. The array in line 70 and the code that immediately follows is meant to speed things up when it comes to changing the shape of the ship as it rotates. See, there are only 36 sprite shapes to represent 360 degrees of rotation. So we're doing the math ahead of time here to pair up a set of shapes with each degree of rotation, since we have 360 degrees and only 36 ship shapes. <laughs> The rim statement in line 74 shows an expanded version of the calculations going on here. The 140 in that line represents the starting ship shape in the rotation. We have to subtract 90 to line up the ship with the degrees because 0 degrees would point our ship to the right, but our first actual sprite shape points straight up. So this is a correction of sorts, and I might fix this for the next video. Then we add 360 degrees to eliminate negative numbers since our integer array cannot do negative numbers. We also add five degrees as a kind of rounding. It just seemed necessary in my tests. And we divide the whole thing by 10 since we are converting 360 degrees into 36 ship shapes. <laughs> so the shorter equation on the left side of line 74 is a condensed version of what's going on in the larger equation. And since we added 360 degrees to keep things from going negative, in line 76 we have to correct for overshoot of our shape range by subtracting 36. So if you thought you'd never have to use the math you learned in high school, then welcome to the world of programming. Now before going further, I have to state that I originally wrote this program to include lots of decimal numbers and decimal arrays. Decimal numbers allow for fractions and negatives, but using them will slow your programs down, even in Vision Basic. And arrays slow things down as well, so a decimal array is even more insidious. These things just create more work for your CPU, which costs precious cycles. The code I wrote did execute within the confines of a single screen refresh, but just barely. And I haven't included any programming for the enemy ships, so clearly the decimal numbers had to go. But speaking to beginners here again, go ahead and use decimal numbers if you need to and just accept the fact that you probably won't be able to fit your entire game loop within the confines of a single screen refresh. I mean, over time you can work your way towards, uh, you know, honing in your skills of speeding things up. But, you know, if you're really like at the beginner level, you know, just keep it beginner. Another reason I ditched the decimal arrays specifically is that they consumed a lot of memory, many thousands of bytes actually. Going onward here, lines 100 to 150 load the sprite shape files into memory. As a temporary thing here, I ask the user if they want the shapes loaded to memory. In this first version of Vision Basic, the area beneath the kernel is typically left alone. So once you load your shapes into that RAM, they're there for the long haul and you don't need to keep loading them from disk and costing you extra time. Because I can't simply load the explosion shapes into the RAM beneath color RAM, as stated earlier, I first load them into the memory starting at 49152. And then I turn off all interrupts in line 120 with the SCI instruction and expose the RAM beneath ROM via the POPs. Then the shapes are copied into this exposed RAM and the kernel is turned back on and interrupts are allowed again via the CLI instruction. The rest of the sprite shapes are loaded normally because loaded data will easily go into the RAM beneath the kernel without issue. Lines 200 to 290 read the cosine data at the end of the program and convert it from the decimal numbers that they are into a form that can be stored into integer arrays for better speed during gameplay. Like I said before, I originally used all decimal arrays, so I had to come up with a way to represent decimal values in integer form. 
Well, the easiest way I know of to do this is to force the decimal portion of each number up into the whole number portion of each number. And we do this by multiplication. But what number shall we use? Well, after looking at the various values in my program, I decided to multiply all the decimal numbers by 64. There are a couple reasons I chose this number. For starters, I have no initial values that are going to exceed a thousand. It's important to note that we don't want the results of our multiplications to exceed the limits of integer values, which is namely 65535. So if we did multiply a value of a thousand by 64, we'd still be below that threshold. But I also chose to use 64 because I want to preserve as many bits of our decimal values as possible. If we look at the cosine values at the end of the program, you'll see what I mean. And we'll scroll up. Okay, our lowest value besides zero and negative values is at the bottom here, 0 0.0175. If we multiply that by 64, we get, I'm type a little program. Okay. And this value 1.12 blah 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 will be rounded into a whole number of one. So even our smallest value here can have some influence on things. So 64 is kind of a sweet spot for us. Another reason to use 64 is as our multiplier is because it is a power of two and we'll be needing to divide many of our inflated numbers by 64 at some point, and dividing by a power of two tends to be much faster. Let's go back up and describe some more lines, shall we? Okay, line 800 copies the character set to slot number 26 so that we can make some minor changes to it. The vidloc command sets us up with a text screen numbered 51. Repeating the value of 51 causes all printing to be diverted to this text screen. Text screen 51 starts at 52224, by the way, which I've, you've heard that already. The vidloc command here also sets us up with the character set 26 that we copy data to. In line 810, we are changing the text color to pink, and this is one of the colors of the mines. Keep in mind, if you don't already know this, that when you enable multicolor mode, text colors between 0 and 7 result in characters that are not multicolored, and text colors between 8 and 15 result in characters that are multicolored. But also keep in mind that colors 8 to 15 will be converted into their darker counterparts for the multicolored characters. Thus, the pink here will be displayed as red. The C64 was designed this way to allow normal characters and multicolored characters to share the screen together. Next, the screen is cleared so that all color cells will be filled with pink and therefore red. Line A20 calls our setup routine, which must be done prior to using the actual smooth scroll routine. Here we establish 120 characters wide by 75 characters tall. The next parameter tells where our text screen will be located, and the final parameter is where the larger image map is located. Since 120 times 75 results in 9,000 character bytes, I have subtracted this from where our text screen is now located to come up with the location for the image map data, 43224. We can't have these things overlapping. I'm also trying to keep this map as high up in memory as possible to avoid conflicts with the variable table. Line 830 calls the routine that I have set up that places the stars and mines on the larger image map. Lines 900 to 930 set up the initial shapes and colors for the sprites that are in use so far. Sprite 0 is our ship, Sprite 1 is the window and thrust of our ship, and Sprite 2 is our lasers. This only leaves us five more sprites left to divide amongst the enemy ships and their lasers. So this is something I will have to figure out when going forward. Speaking of forward, let's page forward. Next, we have our main game loop. Everything before line 1100 is just more setup. Variables px and py represent our position on the grid. 
These variables will be pixel specific, so they will be eight times greater in value than just the limits of 120 times 75 of our image map. So they will actually have limits up to, but not including, 960 and 600. But remember that we are multiplying many of our values by 64, so that increases these limits even further. The initial values of zero for each coordinate represent the upper left-hand corner of the larger image map, and we are not concerned with centering this corner coordinate in the center of the visible text screen. So we have variables SX and SY for our ship coordinates on the actual text screen. For the time being, these are static values and we will be transferring them to the lasers whenever they are first fired. These are spike coordinates. We have variable AN for the angle of our ship, which it will point straight up at 90 degrees. We have variable CYC, which keeps track of our cycling of colors for the ship's thrust and the blinking of the mines. We have a level variable next, LEV, which doesn't really do much right now. I intend for it to relate to the speed of the enemy ships, but I might also have it relate to how many enemy ships there are and possibly how many mines to put on the screen. In line 1020, we have the X and Y coordinates for our laser. For now, we have the laser off screen by setting the X coordinate to an extreme value. We don't want the laser to be hitting any ships that might approach from the screen edge. We also have La Son, <laughs> L-A-S-O-N, <laughs> making it sound French, uh, which is our value that keeps track of whether our laser is actually on or not. In line 1030, we have the count of our lives starting out, and in life is actually a timer for when the ship is in new life mode, and it helps with the blinking and also helps to ignore collision data while it is non-zero. So that's why we are starting it off with a non-zero value. And next is line 1090, where we detect for a character collision between our ship and the background. We need to clear the detection in case it was tripped at any point earlier. That's just something that's required. So anytime you just like start a game, it's like clear it. Just just use the command and it clears it. And the SEI instruction is there because I wish to have the key scan routine disabled. You can leave interrupts on if you wish and possibly turn them off later when you are finished with your game. I just don't want those odd little pauses showing up in the gameplay that are caused by the key scan routine. Okay, now we have our actual game loop, and it's fairly simple for now. Here I mostly plan to branch out to various routines that control various aspects of the game. In regular basic, you may not want to do a whole lot of go subbing, as it can slow your games down, but subroutines in Vision Basic are called at the speed of machine language, so it's not a big deal here. There are places where routine calls can cost important cycles, even in machine language, but that's more of a problem in tight inner loops. Line 1100 calls our smooth scroll routine, and this routine handles the drawing of the screen and the pixel level panning. Next, a routine called cycle is called, and this routine makes use of our CYC variable to rotate through the engine thrust colors and the mine flashing colors. Line 1110 is some assembly language that forces us to wait until the raster line has reached the bottom of the visible text screen, which is raster line 247. Line 1120 is where the border gets changed to green so that we can time what follows, which is our routine called Handle Sprites. Handle Sprites is a routine that moves all of our sprites and handles all shape changes. We want all of this done off screen so that we can avoid the blinking and sharing of sprite shapes. Next, the border gets changed to blue so that we can time what comes next, which is a routine called Move Ship. Move Ship is a routine that handles all movement related to the player spaceship. And at the tail end of the main game loop is some assembly language to check and see if the Q key is being pressed. I just want an easy way to exit the game for now, so that's why the code is here. According to a table in mapping the Commodore 64, to see if the Q key is being pressed, you have to turn off bit seven of register 56320 Bit 7 corresponds to a specific row of keys and has a value of 128. So we subtract 128 from 255 and the resulting value of 127 goes into register 56320. 
We then focus on, on a specific column of keys in the table by reading location 56321 and anding the results with a value of 64, which equals the value of bit 6. If the final result is non-zero, then the Q key has not been pressed. Please don't ask me why it is set up this way. It's all wonky, it's all strange, but hey, I didn't make it. If you want to test for other keys, you have to use other pokes and peaks. Here is the table in the book with the row and column highlighted, as well as the register values involved. Now you can pause the video here for longer examination because I'm going to go onward here. If the Q key is pressed, line 2000 gets executed, which returns the screen to normal, clears the screen, restores interrupts, clears the keyboard buffer, and exits the program. As I've stated in a prior video, when you move the text screen around and have the printing moved to the new location as well, you will need to clear the screen so that the line link table gets reset. Otherwise, a crash could result. Since the normal command moves the screen and printing back to location 1024, it's important to clear the screen after using this command as well. Page forward a couple times. Here we go. Okay, here's the routine that handles the player movements. Our procedure is called move ship in line 3000. In line 3010, we are adjusting the ship angle so that we can convert cosine values into sine values for vertical movements. Remember, the sine values will be negative from what they normally are, but we'll deal with that. So variable an will be for cosine values and san will be for sine values. We use the add command for the math because it converts everything into pure machine language, which is faster. You might be wondering why I didn't include separate arrays for the sine values. Well, again, my focus has been on trying to save memory where I can as a precaution. That's why each cosine array extends to 449 degrees instead of 359. We can reuse each cosine array for sine values by extending the arrays an extra 90 degrees and in the process be saving 75% of the RAM that would have been taken up by the extra arrays for sine values. In lines 3020 and 3030, we are fetching sine and cosine values. I often like to use variables dx and dy in my programs to represent the direction of movement of something. So dx is for the direction of x movement, and dy is for the direction of y movement. But they are also additives. I also want to rewind here for a minute. and point out that not only are all of the cosine array values multiplied by a value of 64 to help preserve some decimal influence, but each array is multiplied by another factor to help speed up the movement of things. The ship speed actually has an extra factor of two up here, so two times 64 equals 128. And this allows the ship to move two pixels per screen refresh instead of one. Actually, again, the background will be doing the movement and the ship will be keeping to the center of the screen. The lasers have a speed factor of three and the swing coast array has a factor of 70 multiplied into the mix. And again, uh, that's gonna have to wait for the next video. And while I'm back up this way, I need to explain what's going on in line 210. Variable V is a decimal variable, and it is the recipient of the cosine value being fetched from the data statements. The LDA instruction is assembly language, and here we are loading the sign of the variable V, and we branch to line 260 if the result is a minus sign. The variable VT in the several lines that follow is also a decimal variable, but all the arrays are integer. So when the contents of VT get transferred, to the array variables, the sign is ignored completely. So in lines 260 to 280, we are forcing a subtraction to render the negative values negative again, sort of. As I've shown a time or two in previous videos, integer variables cannot be negative, but they can still act negative. And I'll illustrate this again. If we type a equals negative one, we will see that the value wraps around to 65535. 
but if we add 65535 to another integer, it will act the same as subtracting 1 from it. And I'll prove it. A equals 5. A equals A plus 65535. Print A. C, 5 plus 65535 equals 4. And 5 minus 1 also equals 4. So there you go. And 65534 acts like a negative 2. And 65533 acts like a negative 3. And so forth. And so on. You can also multiply these fake negatives by other values. And the resulting values will still behave properly. And I'll prove that. So. A equals negative 1. A equals A times 22. B equals 33 plus A. And then we're going to print B and A. And here we see that variable A is becoming a fake version of negative 22. And so adding negative 22 to 33 yields 11. And yet variable A really contains a value of 65514. This all works up to a certain point. The one area where it won't work is you cannot divide these fake negatives by another value and expect them to work properly. It just won't work. Like, you know, you divide uh, 65535 by 2 and it's going to it's going to become, you know, 32767 7, and that's not it's not going to yield the results you're looking for. Anyhow, knowing all of this will help you to understand what's going on when we resume looking at the program. Oops. <laughs> Lister. Okay, so resuming with line 3050, we fetch the shape numbers we need for our ship based on the current angle. Again, we're using the add command for extra speed. These shapes will be utilized in a further routine. In line 3060, we are moving within the larger image map based on our dx and dy variables. This part gets a little tricky for a variety of reasons. The rotation of the ship I created in the spread editor is inverse from the way degrees really rotate. So since the y axis is flipped. So this means that the ship rotates the opposite direction from the actual angle. So long story short, I just had to play around with whether or not dx and dy get added or subtracted from the map coordinates. And here we ended up with dx getting subtracted from px and dy getting added to by. I really didn't want to sketch out the logic on paper, so it was really just trial and error here until I got it right. In hindsight, I guess I should have at least rotated the ship the opposite direction in the spreader, and probably have started it facing to the right. Live and learn. But the good thing is that programming offers us flexibility so we can work around our goofs. In line 3100, we check to see if the ship is in explosion mode. We don't want the player to be able to steer the ship while the ship is exploding or invisible, so the next few lines will be skipped if this is the case. In line 3110, we pull the joystick for left and right movement. Joy 4 returns a special value that can be added to variables to simplify movement without the need for if-then statements. We double the returned value so the movement will be plus or minus 2. The negative values are actually the fake type mentioned earlier, so negative 1 will be represented by the value 65535. When all is said and done, the ship steers 2 degrees at a time. Line 3120 checks to see if the ship angle is negative. I just chose to compare the angle to a value of 9999. If the angle is 65534, that's above 9999, and thus we are going to react to it. And likewise, in line 3130, we compare to see if the angle is 360 or greater. These two lines keep the angle ro rotating between the confines of 0 and 359. The order of execution is important because the second comparison would detect both extremes, but it wouldn't handle the negative angles properly. Lines 3200 and 3270 try to see if we are going outside the edges of our larger image map. The remarks on the right hand side show the comparisons we are trying to make, but keep in mind that our values are inflated by a factor of 64. Notice in line 3220 we have a value of 61440, 
This is 960 multiplied by 64 and represents a type of limit for our image map. Negative values would start at the top of 65535 and work down. So I wanted to find a place in the middle to create a type of dividing line between the values that fall off one end and values that fall off the other, since we really can't have negative values. 63488 falls about halfway in the middle, so we'll test values greater than this for negatives and values below this, but greater than 61440, for positive values that extend too far. Similarly, we do the same with the vertical in lines 3240 and 3260. If we multiply 600 times 64, we get 38400. And halfway between that and 65535 is about 51,968. 51, In line 3240, we test for values above 51,968 as they would be considered negative. And we test values below this, but greater than 38400 for positives that extend too far in, in line 3260. Lines 3210, 3230, 3250, and 3270 make the necessary adjustments to create a wraparound for our map when values exceed their limits. Okay, I created this graphic to help make some sense of these values I have been talking about here. Um, just pause the video if needed to get a longer look at it but I must move on. Moving forward here, line 3280 skips the next few lines if we are in new life mode. We don't want to worry about collisions if our ship has just appeared on the scene and we don't want to have it, we don't want it firing its lasers. Line 3300 detects for collisions between our ship and the mines in the background. We are detecting for only sprite zero here. If a collision is detected, we will increase the value of the variable explode. This variable acts as a flag but also a timer of sorts and also helps to determine which shape in a series of shapes to display during the explosion. In line 3310 we want to skip the part that reads the joystick button if our ship is exploding. After all an exploding ship does not under normal circumstances shoot out lasers. The next line 3320 has us also skip joystick button detection if we already have a laser on the screen. Line 3330 checks the button of joystick number two and pretty much assigns the result to the Lasson flag, which is short for laser on. And line 3340 calls the routine player laser, which appears below. We could just simply fall through to the next routine, but it's not a huge deal. I mean, if I end up adding more lines to this particular routine, calling player laser here will likely prove to be the better option. Line 3400 exists here for that reason, a line where new content could be added. Now we have the routine that moves the laser. In line 4010, we are exiting to line 4300 if our Lasson variable is zero because zero is less than one. And we branch off to line 4100 if the value of Lasson is not 1. A value of 1 means that the fire button has been pressed, but we haven't actually put the laser on the screen yet. The math in lines 4020 and 4040 take the heading of our ship and use it to put the laser out away from our ship a little bit. We're taking the speed of the ship and multiplying it by 3 by using repetitive addition, and then we add this to the ship's location on the screen so that our laser can have a starting point. Line 4050 increase our Lasson variable from a value of 1 to a, vari a value of 2. And we define the shape for our laser using the shape for the ship and just adding 72 to it. And in line 4060 we apply the shape to mob number 2 aka sprite number two. Okay, in lines 4100 and 4110 we are actually moving our laser. Not only do we have to add variables LXP and LYP to the laser's current position and these variables control its speed and direction, but we also have to add or subtract the screen movement as well since the laser is aligned with screen movement and not the ship's movement. We don't want the laser making turns when the ship turns, right? 
And in lines 4120 at 24150, we are checking to see if the laser is off screen or mostly off screen anyhow. Again, these values we are comparing against have been multiplied by 64, but you can see the original values in the remarks on the right hand side. We want to catch the laser before it gets too far off screen because we don't want it to hit an enemy ship that might be making an entrance. I chose the values you see here based on observation instead of straight up calculations. If the laser looked like it was off screen at a certain coordinate, then I made that the barrier. Sprites have different sizes and shapes that can impact the calculations. And line 4200 sets the laser on variable to zero. <laughs> to zero if the laser has ended up off screen. And the laser's x coordinate is set to an extreme distance to help prevent collisions with emerging enemy ships. I could push the laser even further off screen if necessary. In lines 8000 to 8040, this is the color cycling routine mentioned earlier. It just cycles the colors for the engine thrust and the mine flashing. I'm just poking these registers directly for the sake of speed. And like I said earlier, I would rather do this with assembly language since that's an easy thing to code in machine language, but I left it in basic to show that you can leave things in basic and still get decent speeds. And I'd like to point out that I often code in basic and I will change out certain commands with others as time goes on. For example, looking back to up to lines 4100 to 4150, I probably started out with regular math expressions and if then statements in these lines and then converted them over to use faster commands available in Vision Basic like add, sub, and comp. These conversions are not too difficult and should be done when you're confident that the original lines are working as intended. Next, we have a routine called make stars starting at line 9000. In line 9000, I'm defining a decimal variable Rn for random number generation. Not exactly the best practice to define decimal variables in the middle of, of a program, but it's my program, so hey, I'm a rebel. In line 9000, uh, 9010, we are turning off interrupts and the basic and kernel ROMs. This is because, if you remember, our character set starts out under the RAM that rests beneath the VIC2 chip registers and the SID registers. In line 9020, we are using the charpat command to change the code pointer so that it points to the 64th character of the 26th character set. I think this is a shifted asterisk character. Next, we have several characters being redefined, and four of them are just simple stars. Again, the stars use bit pair 01 so that they won't be detected during collisions with sprites, and bit pair 01 is represented by the plus sign. As you can see, I've just positioned the star in different spots to help create a more random look when we put them all over the background. You'll notice that the designs for the characters look a bit slender. This is because the characters we are using here, plus and period, each represent a bit pair that is two bits wide. This is how it works for multicolor characters. When de redefining high-res characters, you'll be using a wider grid of characters to define them. Each further use of the charpat command isn't really necessary since these, command since these characters are all uh, in sequence but it helps to show which character is being redefined. The commands you see here are great for redefining a handful of characters, but I would recommend using a character editor for, a, for large sets of redefined characters. These two character patterns here are part of the mine, top left and top right. I actually drew the, the patterns out in the Spreadator Sprite Editor and then just visibly converted everything into these code statements. And then the bottom two character patterns for the mine for a total of four characters per mine. Okay, after redefining eight characters, we turn the kernel back on with a, the poke in line 9500 and we turn interrupts back on. In line 9510, we fill the large image map with space characters and we turn on multicolor mode and also set the two shared colors of multicolor mode, white and pink. 
In lines 9520 to 9550, we're just plotting about 500 stars randomly over the image map. Next, in lines 9600 to 9680, we are plotting 30 mines randomly onto the image map. I'm not going to explain every detail about the method I'm using here, but I wanted the mines to be spaced out a certain distance from each other, and I didn't want any mines that are near each other to be perfectly horizontal or vertical of each other. So some mines get shifted a little bit. I also line them up so that when the game first starts, the player ship doesn't immediately run into one of them. I plan to involve the game level in determining how many mines get put onto the map, but for now, the number is 30. Our next routine is called enemy speed, and this routine is supposed to set up the cosine values for the enemy ship based on the current level. I will probably make the speed change less dramatic than what this routine might dish out for the higher levels. Also, this routine was created when the arrays were decimal, so it will have to be modified for the integer version of the array. This next routine is called Sprite, and it's supposed to take our inflated Sprite coordinate numbers and divide them all by 64 before putting them into the mob xy command. The downside with this routine is that values are passed between this routine and the user-defined command that calls it, and it takes more time than I'd like, so in my next video I will probably modify the routine to run faster. The next routine is one called Handle Sprites. It essentially moves the sprites and, and changes their shapes while the raster line is off screen. I don't want my sprites to blink or shear, so that's why I created this routine. Line 12,010, 12, we're getting high up there, sets the position for the player ship. Line 12,020 branches if the explode variable is essentially zero. Line 12,030 sets both shapes for the player ship to the blank sprite shape we mentioned earlier. Line 12,040 branches if the explosion is done, though a timer will continue to keep the ship from being visible for a little while. Line 12,050 adds the explosion timer to the value of 95 to help progress the explosion through the series of explosion shapes. The explosion shapes run from 96 to 132. Line 12,060 cycle, cycles the explosion colors using our array EX. Line 12,070 cycles the explode variable forward. Line 12,080 branches if we have not reached the end of our explode timer, which I have set at 120. We could increase this value and the ship would remain invisible for a longer duration if desired. Line 12,090 sets the explode variable back to zero since our explosion cycle has reached its end. Then we must set the in life variable to the value of two. We essentially want to start the next cycle where the ship is blinking and protected from collisions. The reason we are using a value of two is that the NL array holds a zero at two which will start us off with the ship being black. If we start at one, that will render the ship dark gray for a very tiny moment, which will appear odd for the viewer. The NL array is set up in such a way that the cycled colors will land on the right color when the new life cycle is done. This keeps us from having to correct the color with a separate statement. Line 12,100 branches if we are not in new life mode line 12 this is these long numbers line 12110 extracts the lower four bits of the in life timer so that it can be fed into the nl array to set the color of the ship as it blinks through the various grayscale colors line 12120 increments the in life timer and in Line 12,130 branches if we have not reached the end of the timer. In line 12,140, the end life timer is set back to zero and the collision detection register is cleared just in case it has been triggered earlier. And line 12,200 sets the shapes for our ship based on the contents of SH1 and SH2. Keep in mind that these two variables are normally set by the move ship routine 
though you can see that the lines above can also affect their values. And as you can see in line 12300, we are setting the location for the laser sprite. This happens whether or not the laser is active. Our chosen off-screen value keeps it from being visible. I just like to keep the code simple instead of trying to turn the sprite off when not in use. And that's it of the code so far. We have already inspected the code below, and as much as I'd like to show you all some more stuff, I really need to stop here for now. Feel free to use the add-on pack associated with this video. Just visit the media page of my website, visionbasic.net, and look for this video. It probably won't be available immediately after I post this video, though. There should be a link to a disk image containing files related to this video. All of the files will be Vision Basic files, of course. Before I go, I'd like to point you guys to a couple channels you might be interested in. The first channel comes to us from Italy, and it's called Commodore Mania Channel. Several folks from Italy have purchased Vision Basic, so I know there are a decent amount of Commodore fans in Italy, and they would appreciate what this channel has to offer, as well as anyone else who knows Italian. As the name Commodore Mania suggests, this site covers pretty much anything Commodore related. I have had wonderful email conversations with Carlo Pastore from the website. He's a really nice guy, friendly, and very courteous. He also has an Instagram that I will share in the description. The next channel I'd like to bring your attention to is called CitiZen. These guys are passionate about a whole lot of things. On their channel, you will find videos on programming, hardware, and game reviews, and some crazy stuff like launching a fireworks display using their Commodore 64 and a joystick. And apparently their videos got the attention of an AI colony deep in the reaches of outer space, and this AI has decided to hone in on our planet and assimilate Earth. If you don't believe me, uh, just watch the channel for yourself. There you'll meet characters like Miss Doss, Clicky, Amy, Pokey, and more in a hearty dose of 80s parody and nostalgia. Even 8-Bit Show and Tell made a guest appearance on their channel. Anyhow, take a moment to see what these two channels are all about, and if you like what you see, give them a like and subscribe to them. I'm all about supporting our community, and I hope you are too. And that wraps up this episode of Vision Basic. I thank you all for watching my video. Please like and share my video, and also subscribe for more similar content. And make sure to visit visionbasic.net.